Hello and welcome to my channel. Today we'll be discussing the uh, stomach. Um, it's um, um, uh, there is a rule uh, you should know some rules about the GI tract. It's a continuous tube from the oral cavity down to the anus, and whatever changes happens to the tube in different areas. Uh, marks the uh, organ present at that area. Like, for example, it dilates uh, the stomach area to form the stomach. See, it rotates uh, uh, outside the body and comes back to the body again in the intestinal region. But it is a continuous uh, tube. Uh, the stomach is part of that tube, of course. It's uh, 1,500 milliliters capacity. Uh, lies in the epigastric and left hypochondriac regions and extends to the lumbar region and by the way by after a heavy meal in in uh, in some uh, persons it may reach to the left iliac fossa uh, actually um, um, I remember when, when we were uh, at night shift in emergency, someone came with a bullet passing through his abdomen, and because he ate too much before that, the stomach saved his life, you know, by pushing the viscera backwards, and the stomach was uh, distended down to the iliac, uh, left iliac fossa. So anyway, it's, uh, uh, it's cha it changes its, um, um, its shape with meals but this is the average capacity 1500 milliliters and uh please imagine that uh, uh, the stomach was facing you anteriorly with its less, lesser curve lesser curvature and uh, that was turned to the right and the stomach itself is put in a rather horizontal uh, position you know it's not like that no it's um, in, um, in, um, when the organs are properly arranged, it assumes uh, a, a rather oblique uh, position. It has an anterior superior surface and a posterior inferior surface. The orifices of the stomach, uh, of course, we have the cardia, the part that receives the esophagus. It's present at the level of T11, behind the seventh costal cartilage. T11 and the esophagus enters the abdomen at T10, so it travels for a distance of one vertebra. Remember this from 10 to 11. 11 marks the cardia. And the right border of the esophagus continues as the lesser curvature of the stomach, as you can see here. The left border of the stomach uh, makes a notch and then continues as the greater curvature of the stomach, as you can see here. So it's a continuation of the esophagus, actually, with all its uh, muscle layers. It has three muscle layers in different directions, horizontal, vertical, and oblique, uh, to um, make sure to provide mixing movements uh, to the food inside. To contract in all directions and sometimes in in uh, barium meals x-ray of the stomach with barium you can find a contraction uh, in in the wall of the stomach distorting its shape um, the pyloric orifice on the other hand continues as the duodenum and uh, uh, the transpyloric plane passes through it it's at the level of l1 vertebra so remember T11 and L1 uh, uh, vertebra, vertebra to the right of the midline. The curvatures, we have the lesser curvature of the stomach uh, that has an incisura in it. Like, you know, the first depression you find is this one. And when you uh, make a perpendicular line on the incisura, it marks uh, uh, the beginning of the pylorus pyloric antrum pyloric canal and then pylorus the beginning of the pyloric antrum that will lead you to the pylorus the wall starts to thicken gradually until it uh, maximum thickness at the uh, at the point of the sphincter the pyloric sphincter okay and this is the greater curvature uh, uh, of course uh, the peritoneal attached, uh, remember at the fundus, I, uh, we saw before 
uh, with the peritoneum, the gastrosplenic ligament, the gastrosplenic ligament extending from the fundus to the stomach. Uh, there's the lesser omentum, as you can see here, that uh, stretches between the lesser curvature of the stomach and the porta hepatis of the liver. And the greater omentum that's attached to the greater curvature of the stomach and we know how it's formed remember the bag we threw on the lesser curvature of the stomach and we pulled back again from underneath the greater curvature to form the four layered structure known as the greater omentum so anything behind the stomach is separated from the stomach by the lesser sac exactly the lesser sac now you understand what's happening with the uh, peritoneum uh, you can divide the stomach into a fundus, you know, a transverse line from the cardia to the greater curvature. Uh, above that is the fundus, and it's usually filled with gas. Air bubbles, when you see uh, see it, it's very evident in plain x-rays of, uh, of, uh, of the GI. Uh, the bubbles in the fundus of the, of the stomach last to be filled, of course, after the stomach is filled. Then beyond that, we have the body of the stomach, which takes the most part of the stomach. Then uh, beyond the line perpendicular to the incisure, as I showed you in the last slide, the beginning of the pyloric antrum, the entrance to the pylorus. Uh, a region with different, um, different distribution of cells, gastric cells, of course especially for those that secretes the HCL and then uh, the pyloric canal uh, as the wall thickens ending with the pylorus which is the junction of the stomach with the first part of the uh, duodenum okay so we have fundus we have body pyloric antrum uh, pyloric canal and uh, pylorus these are the parts of the stomach uh, the surfaces, as I told you, it's uh, anterior superior surface and posterior inferior surface. Now, the relations of these surfaces, as you can see here, see, the stomach is an oblique position. See how it has anterior superior and posterior inferior surfaces. Now, the anterior superior surface to the right related to the left lobe of liver and the quadrate lobe of liver here in this area doesn't reach the gallbladder no only for the left lobe of liver and it doesn't cover the whole stomach as well you can see the pyloric antrum projects uh, downwards and to the left after the liver ends we have remember we have the diaphragm here so uh, uh, the diaphragm separates the upper part of the stomach from the thoracic cage with the costodiaphragmatic recess in it and on the left side, extreme left, it, uh, uh, it impresses the medial surface of the spleen, forming what's so called the gastric impression. Uh, th these are the, antro, the anterior relations or antero superior relations of the stomach. Now, the postero inferior relations, when you reflect the stomach upwards, you will see what's so-called the stomach bed. It's not the whole plate, of course. Uh, ends at the uh, start of the, uh, of the duodenum, beginning of the duodenum. So we are talking about this area. We are talking about this area as the stomach bed. What you can see in this area, the pancreas, of course, that water jejunal, jejunal flexure behind the stomach, yes. And the splenic artery, at the top of the pancreas and behind the, the splenic vein with the renal vessels left renal vessels and the upper part of the left kidney and the suprarenal gland going uh, further laterally you find uh, the transverse colon crossing to the left colic uh, flexure all of this is the stomach bed it's easy uh, it's easy to uh, it's easy to know by you know understanding the relations from uh, from a cadaver or from a plate like this instead of learning it by heart what you can see here is the stomach bread of course all these structures are separated from the stomach by the lesser sac everything the first posterior relation of the stomach is the lesser uh, sac okay 
And as we saw before, uh, the gastric mucosa is thrown into folds. You can see these folds to allow for the distension of the stomach, of course. These are called gastric rougeae gastric rouge and rather longitudinal folds here that directs the food entering the stomach to its lower part and then starts to fill up so it's thrown into gastric rouge uh, yes um, the peritoneum of the stomach we have to, of course the lesser, lesser omentum and greater omentum the lesser omentum as you can see here stretches from the lesser curvature to the stomach but it has two parts actually the hepatogastric part and the hepatoduodenal part to the first part the free which marks the free edge of the lesser omentum we have the hepatogastric ligament they call it the hepatogastric ligament and the hepatoduodenal ligament and they are both the same double layered lesser omentum so don't get confused the contents of the lesser omentum uh, in the gastro uh, hepatogastric ligament we have the left gastric vessels the right gastric vessels we have the vagal trunks uh, with their branches the nerves of latergé uh, supplying the stomach and the hepatic and celiac branches to the celiac plexus and the hepatic plexus we have all the nerves and all the vessels uh, supplying the lesser curvature of the stomach and at the hepatoduodenal part, we have the famous triad, which is the common bile duct to the right, the common hepatic artery or the hepatic artery to the left, and the portal vein in between and posterior. So we have the common bile duct, we have the hepatic artery, and the portal uh, vein. Remember this. So altogether, the contents of the hepatoduodenal ligament and the hepatogastric ligament uh, are the contents of the lesser omentum. I have a barium meal uh, x-ray here. See see the, 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 the contraction wave? You can see that distorting the shape of the stomach. This is a normal contraction uh, wave. See the incisura here and the pyloric antrum and the pylorus and the beginning of the duodenum as the du duodenal cap. They call the first part of the first part of the duodenum is the duodenal uh, cap. And then you can see the jejunum and ileum here. And I want you to recall this. Of course, we will see it again in the intestine, but see how the jejunum is feathered like appearance because of the thick, folded, highly thick, highly folded mucosa, different than the ileum, which appears as smooth uh, coils of intestine here. Okay. The blood supply of the stomach, um, it's a numerous blood supply to make sure that every part, uh, it, it, it takes uh, all the blo blood supply it can, actually. From the celiac trunk of the aorta arises the left gastric artery. See, the, uh, these are branches of the left gastric artery. The left gastric ascends up and then enters between the layers of the lesser omentum and then to runs parallel to the lesser curvature uh, from superior to inferior as you can see here sending gastric branches to supply the stomach we have an, a, a right gastric artery coming from the hepatic or common hepatic or gastroduodenal but commonly from hepatic to run uh, uh, parallel to the lesser curvature but coming from the right sides uh, supplying the stomach as well so this is the supply at the lesser curvature side. Remember that the left gastric artery sends C esophageal branches that enters the thorax, actually supplying the esophagus. So this means that the veins coming from the lower esophagus will have uh, an anastomosis with the portal circulation because these veins will eventually end up in the portal vein. This is the second rule. Every absorptive uh, surface in the GI must be drained to the liver first. So all the absorptive surface from the lower part of the esophagus through the stomach to the jejuna, duodenum, jejunum and ileum and colon will all go to the portal vein first for the blood to be detoxified and then 
by means of hepatic veins empties into the inferior vena cava as clean blood, okay? So as, as I told you before, um, uh, all food is toxic, to, uh, contains toxic substances to the human body and must be detoxified. For the rest of the blood supply, we have the list left gastroepiploic. Gastroepiploic means it supplies the stomach and supplies the greater omentum as well. It has long omental branches, you can see here, running parallel to the greater curvature of the stomach. This comes from the splenic artery, see? The splenic artery goes uh, above the this uh, this is the branches from the left gastric may this is maybe the splenic i can't see its course uh, i can see it's going down so maybe it's left gastric but if it went laterally we must expose the area this is the splenic it gives the at the fundus of the stomach short gastric vessels that supplies the fundus of the stomach and gives the left gastroepiploic that descends uh, parallel to the greater curvature of the stomach. And anastomose with the right gastroepiploic uh, coming from the gastroduodenal artery on the right side, see? And anastomose with the left gastroepiploic, it sends also epiploic branches. All these uh, give gastric branches, anterior and posterior, to supply different parts of the stomach. So remember, left and right gastric vessels, the short gastric vessels for the fundus, and left and right gastroepiploic vessels for along the greater curvature part, of course supplying not the greater curvature only, but since the branches supply the corresponding part of the uh, walls of the uh, stomach. Okay, um, um, and remember the source here, the celiac trunk, the source here is the splenic artery, the source here is the gastroduodenal artery. The gastroduodenal, we will talk uh, uh, more about it uh, with the duodenum because it passes behind the first part of the duodenum and gets involved in posterior wall ulcers. This is the cause of bleeding, internal bleeding that's happening in uh, the posterior duodenal ulcers from the gastroduodenal uh, artery. Uh, gastroduodenal arises from the common hepatic uh, and uh, be descends behind the first part of the duodenum. And uh, as I told you, involved in duodenal ulcers, it gives the right gastroepiploic and the superior pancreatic duodenal artery, which supplies the head. We will talk about this in details with the pancreas and uh, duodenum. This is the splenic artery I was talking about. The splenic artery, see, has its uh, tortuous course with the peaks above the pancreas and the troughs hidden behind the pancreas. So it's partially hidden behind the pancreas. And see how it gives here the short gastric vessels that supply the stomach. See that? And it gives the left gastroepiploic, the stomach is reflected here, that anastomose with the right gastroepiploic. Um, uh, now the splenic divides into uh, five, six branches because the spleen was in the form of splenules before, during development, and they coalesce together to form the spleen. That's why every part of the spleen, segment of the spleen, has its own blood supply, its own uh, branch. It's easy if you understand how the stomach is being supplied. Instead of, as I told you before, don't start by learning things by heart. Understand what's happening and you can actually fi figure out the answers to multiple choice questions. This is the celiac trunk here. Remember, the celiac trunk was not uh, part of the, of the bed of the stomach. It was above the pylorus. So it's not a part of the posterior uh, relations of the stomach. Okay, another plate here just to show you the epiploic branches. See how long they are? The epiploic branches, these were running in the greater omentum to supply the greater omentum. And this is the right gastroepiploic, of course. This is to show you. And here, uh, the splenic vein coming from the spleen. Okay, the branches from the splenic vein. Uh, forming the splenic vein behind the pancreas, not as the artery, the artery above it, above it is partially 
concealed by the pancreas, but the peaks of the artery uh, uh, are above the pancreas. Okay, veins. Um, uh, we have the portal vein. Uh, I told you before that the, everything coming, every uh, blood coming from absorptive surface um, uh, or a GI surface must go to the liver first. See how the portal vein is formed by the union of the splenic and the superior mesenteric vein. See, we will study the mesenteric veins with the intestine. This is the superior mesenteric joining the uh, splenic vein behind the neck of pancreas forming the portal ascending in the to uh, as part of the famous triad the common bile duct the hepatic artery and the portal vein and of course it's, it receives multiple branches the venous drainage of the stomach as you can see here the left and right gastrics and uh, short gastric to the splenic and then to the portal everything goes back to the portal uh, if you found yourself mentioning or talking about hepatic veins, so you're wrong. Everything comes from the GI, must pass through the liver by means of the uh, portal vein. And now you can understand how portal hypertension, especially in liver cirrhosis, reflects itself on the all, all the GI tract, actually. Okay. Um, um, this is about the venous uh, drainage of the uh, stomach. Now, one more thing about the splenic vein here. Uh, the splenic vein is straight, not tortuous, like the artery, and it sticks to the back of the pancreas below the artery. This is a multiple choice. Below The vein below the artery, the artery above it. Okay. Uh, the lymph drainage of the stomach... And they name the groups of lymph nodes according to their uh, site, like the superior gastric uh, lymph nodes, inferior gastric lymph nodes with a greater curvature. We have the pancreatico splenic lymph nodes running along the pancreas and draining all the fundus, you know, the, the fundus to the splenic lymph nodes and then to the pancreatico splenic lymph nodes, then to the duodenal lymph nodes, to the pyloric lymph nodes to the lymph node of the anterior border of foramen of Winslow, but all this of, will, uh, of course, will end up eventually in the celiac lymph nodes that will form the cisterna chile on its right, the cisterna chile, the origin of the thoracic duct. So all the nodes, according to their uh, uh, site, according to their location, see the extensive lymphatic drainage of the uh, stomach. Uh, for the nerve supply of the stomach, I couldn't find a plate, of course, uh, that uh, marks the branches I want to talk about, like the vagal trunks and the nerves of latter J. Say, see, the vagi we left in the thorax uh, by forming the esophageal plexus now, from the plexus, they arise again by inter after intermixing some fibers into anterior and posterior vagal trunks. I told you before, imagine yourself looking at the lesser curvature from at front, and then it turned to the right. So, the anterior will, uh, the left will become anterior, and the posterior will, uh, and the, uh, sorry, the right will become posterior when you turn the whole thing to the right. This is the anterior vagal trunk, as you can see here. It uh, divides into branches supplying uh, the stomach as long as it reaches the cardia, the fundus, uh, and sends a branch called the nerve of Latterge uh, to supply the corresponding parts of the body of the stomach. Okay. The important thing to know here is that the anterior supplies the pylorus as well. Why do we need a supply to the pylorus to prevent stasis in the stomach? Because this part that pushes food inside the duodenum, it's essential to prevent stasis in the stomach. And this is the complication of the non-specific you know, non uh, uh, vagotomy. When you cut the 
truncal, uh, perform a truncal vagotomy, cut the whole trunk, you will uh, denervate the pylorus from its uh, nerve supply and the complication will be stasis in the stomach. So you'll, uh, your uh, target or your aim here to uh, uh, provide relief and vagotomy as much as possible because the patient is always uh, complaining of hyperacidity. You want to reduce the acid production in the stomach, but at the same time, uh, preserve uh, uh, preserve the motility of the stomach. So there is a highly specific vagotomy here where you cut only the gastric branches that supply the parts of the stomach and leave the pyloric uh, parts intact. Also note that the this anterior vagal trunk sends a nerve C hepatic branch going to the hepatic plexus around the portus, porta hepatis that is formed there. So it has a hepatic branch, it supplies the pylorus and the body and uh, the rest of the stomach. The posterior vagal trunk, uh, and when it enters the, uh, the abdomen, it's not posterior, and this is important for surgeons. You will find it at the right side of the esophagus, see? You will find it at the right side of the esophagus. This is important information. It's a multiple choice question, actually. So on the right side of the esophagus, it descends parallel to the lesser curvature, giving the posterior nerve of Latergé. By the way, in some books, the only name, the nerve of Latergé, uh, apply this name on the posterior branch, not the anterior branch as well, but in many sources, it's both the anterior and posterior branches are called nerves of Latergé that supply the stomach. And note that it does not supply the pylorus, the pyloric antrum or pylorus. It does not reach there, okay? And also note that it send, uh, sends a celiac branch to the celiac plexus or celiac ganglia, where it then the vagal supply will be distributed along the vessels to all, the, all parts of the GI. And this is how the vagal, um, uh, vagal influence is, is being, you know, continued. The vagi themselves end at this level by giving by supplying the stomach and giving hepatic and poor and celiac branches, but then uh, branches from those uh, celiac plexuses, either the celiac plexus, superior mesenteric or inferior mesenteric plexuses, will continue the effect of uh, sorry the superior only it, its limit is the superior mesenteric plexus, not the inferior mesenteric. Apologize for that because the inferior mesenteric carries its, its parasympathetic supply from the pelvic splanchnix. So the lower limit of the influence of the vagus is the superior mesenteric plexus, means that uh, it supplies the GI, the stomach, the duodenum, the jejunum, ileum, ascending colon, and right uh, uh, two thirds of the transverse colon, and then stops. This is the uh, point where the vagal supply uh, stops. Okay, this is about the nerve supply of the stomach. Some clinical points or hints about the stomach, like the hiatus hernia, we talked about this before. There is a sliding hiatus hernia in which the cardia is taken up into the uh, thorax, and uh, the patient will be complaining of regurgitation, uh, severe, you know, uh, heartburn, uh, especially after meals, after the acid is uh, produced, uh, or, or when lying recumbent, uh, recumbent for example. The uh, paraesophageal hernia, well, the fundus is taken up and the cardia in place, uh, and this you diagnose by finding the air bubbles in the fundus, you find it in the thorax. This is very characteristic of uh, this type of hernia. Some uh, infants born with a, with a congenital anomaly in which there is a pylorus spasm, so um, um, a simple operation to, uh, to release the spasm of the pylorus, pyloric hypertrophy. Um, uh, if, you are, uh, if you are performing um, gastroscopy or endoscopy, uh, you should learn the constrictions you will face when introducing the gastroscope. 
the cardia is 40 centimeters from the incisor teeth and we talked about this before when using the endoscopy the vagotomy for patients who uh, uh, complain uh, have hyperacidity uh, uh, or regurgitation, whatever the cause, and uh, there is an indication for vagotomy. There is the truncal vagotomy that leads to stasis, as we mentioned, as we discussed before uh, with you, um, and uh, selective or posterior branch uh, because it's safe to uh, take it away because it does not supply the pylorus. And the highly selective ones, when you keep the anterior and posterior branches, but uh, it's only the gastric branches, the minute gastric branches, and it's a difficult operation, uh, needs more time. Okay, uh, that was um, uh, uh, the essential anatomy of, uh, which is not actually very concise, it's, it has lots of information that will help you in solving multiple choice questions about the stomach. I hope you got the maximum benefit from this lecture and thank you very much for watching.